Welcome to Inside Minneapolis. In this show, we're going to talk about redevelopment on the north side, especially housing issues in the Holman Decree. We're happy to be at the Sumner Library, a very charming library here right off Olson Memorial Highway. Don't be surprised if you hear a few patrons in the background. We'll see you inside. The Minneapolis Legal Aid Society and the NAACP filed the Holman versus Cisneros housing discrimination lawsuit in the summer of 1992. All sides of those who were sued and were sued agreed to negotiate a settlement based on two primary thru th thrusts, housing quality and housing choice. The federal district court approved and issued a consent decree on April 20th, 1995. Implementation of that dissent decree has been underway since that time. The primary components of the settlement included $117 million in funding to come from HUD for the development of 770 new public housing units and 900 new Section 8 certificates and vouchers. Both the housing and the certificates and vouchers uh, were for use both in the city limits and outside of the city limits. The consent decree defined the process that must be followed in developing an action plan for the redevelopment of the area on the city's north side in and around the Summer, Sumner Olson and Glenwood Lindale public housing developments. Two community focus groups were established and met from February 1996 through November 1996 to identify recommendations to be included in this action plan. The City Council of Minneapolis approved the action plan in December 1997. The action plan, the dream that came out of these focus groups, calls for 450 new mixed income housing units, 25% of which must be public housing, with the balance representing a range of incomes, both home ownership as well as rental. A park <clears throat> containing wetlands and ponds, a parkway connection bridging north and south Minneapolis, institutional and commercial services to support the community. Redevelopment of the area of Olson, north of Olson Memorial Highway is expected to begin in the year 2000. Redevelopment south of Olson to begin in 2001 or 2002. At least 30% of the jobs created through the redevelopment project will benefit public housing and other area low-income residents. Well, what you just saw was a brief overview of uh, some of the issues that uh, led up to the Holman decision, which we'll be talking about uh, in a little bit more detail later on in this show, Alfred Babington Johnson led that through at a recent meeting at North High to talk about those issues with community members. Um, for a little background, a little history on uh, North Side development and some of the housing issues, I have two guests who I think are excellent to talk about this. Uh, former state legislator Richard Jefferson, thank you for being here. And council president Jackie Cherry Holmes. Hi Phil. Holmes, thank you for being here. Um, for folks that maybe aren't familiar with the part of town that we're talking about, um, we're talking about near north and some of the housing and development issues. Jackie, could you just outline what we're referring to up here? Well, I think the area we're referring to is uh, from the freeway on the east to Theaterworth Park on the west, from about Chestnut Avenue uh, in the Harrison neighborhood, which is sort of right down by Bassett Creek, or you can think of it as Bassett Creek as a southern border, up to West Broadway. And that's the community okay. we've been talking about. Great. And Richard Jefferson, we were talking earlier about your life and career in this part of town. Yes. Um, can you give us a little background from your perspective of what living in the north side has been about and some of the issues that you've encountered? Well, I moved here in the early 60s and um, the era in which I moved in was when we were fighting the renewal project. When they used to bring in the bulldozers and knock things down without any citizen input whatsoever. And um, that is essentially how I got started and involved in the housing programs here was when we were in the struggle to have some resident input in what they did to neighborhoods. And what you were doing at, the, at that time to earn a living was really quite different from what you went on in your political career. That's correct. Uh, by profession, I'm a chemist, and I was uh, a chemist with the federal government for over 30 years. So. All right. 
Uh, we're sitting here in the Sumner Library, and you were saying also that you lived, at least for a while, right, right across the street. Right across the street, 1119. Well, since that time, Richard, what have been some of the biggest changes that you've seen in those, what, 30, 35 years? Well, I think um, the, the philosophy in which um, government has looked at, at how we deal with, with neighborhoods and with, with housing. As I say, initially, we, uh, we were, were fighting government. They used to come in without any input whatsoever. And we went to um, a period that they made money available for rehab, but no money for new construction. And we, we spent a lot of money rehabbing some structures that we would have probably been better off by tearing them down and, and building new. And into an era now where we are tearing down uh, eyesores in neighborhoods and dilapidated housing and building new housing. Well, and so we've gone the, the full gamut in, in, in over the last 30 years. And I'm assuming from what you're saying, with much more responsiveness to citizen input. Correct. And Jackie, your career also starts here, as I understand it. Can you just outline a little bit about where you got started? Well, first of all, I need to say Jeff is much too understated about his career here. Yes. Um, Jeff was involved in uh, the, the whole citizen participation movement of, of creating uh, what we call project area committees or PACs, uh, the one on the north side with the North Side Residents Redevelopment Council, which I later went on to work for. Um, but that was really the start of citizen input. Jeff then went on to chair the uh, Public Housing Authority and the Community Development Agency. So his background has been in housing throughout uh, throughout our whole community and, and throughout the last you know 30 to 40 years. I came on the scene about 25 years ago and uh, as a new homeowner on 13th and Newton and uh, saw a need to get involved in uh, community organizing, community activism. Uh, did some volunteer work with the neighborhood group, uh, went on to work for the Northside Residents Council and later moved on to the City Council. Was housing always a central issue as well as other things that were going on up here? Oh, housing's always been a central issue, and for me, it's been a personal passion. I mean, I've, I've always been involved in issues involving housing and access to housing, affordability of housing, um, uh, diversity of housing. You know, that's been my, my personal uh, interest, but it's also been an uh, a, a issue that's really shaped this neighborhood. Well, you mentioned um, citizen participation. Now, from something I read, was not NERC, uh, the organization you, you work with, um, the first publicly funded neighborhood organization? Is that a piece of history that I'm right about? It's the first one that the city had a, a contract with for resident input. Which presumably started that formal citizen participation mm -hmm. yes. effort that we, we live with today. Yes. That's great. You then went on to the state legislature uh, in, what, the 80s? In 19, I was elected in 1986, took office in 87. And what propelled you into that? Was it the issues that you were facing here? Well, there were several different things, but uh, <laughs> Sounds and, like and, there's a story and, here. and we won't get into all of that. <laughs> but I would like, as far as housing is concerned, yeah. when I first went to the legislature, uh, the city of Minneapolis did not have a representative that was was well versed in housing issues, and and they looked at me as the authority for the city to uh, for for housing issues, and we had many problems that we, we dealt with, and uh, I. I carried the, the bill that resulted in the housing court that's, that's been established. Um, the, uh, another one that I recall was uh, the one that people were getting ripped off in this area. As I talked to you earlier about, they were renting property to people mm -hmm. that they didn't even own. They were renting property to people that had been condemned. And uh, we got legislation that, that permitted the community to, to, to deal with people that was ripping it off like that. While we're chatting, we're going to bring up on the screen some images, a little photo montage of folks moving mm -hmm. into or living in the Lindale neighborhood and I think Sumner Olson. Just some background images of what mm -hmm. was going on. This is in the 50s and the 60s, kind of evocative of that era. Um, Richard, when you were involved with the Housing and Redevelopment Authority, what was its role particularly here on Northside housing issues? Well, again, Moving from that area where government just was, was heavy-handed about everything they did to really finding out what the community want, what the people who lived here was doing, and answering the housing needs the, and keeping housing affordable. And who would participate in that sort of thing? Was this a council or uh, an officially appointed position? At, at that time, the HRA, the uh, Housing Redevelopment Authority, this was before the MCDA existed, um, was really the, the contact area for that, and then was acted upon by the city council. 
You know, I think that, that the, the issue of citizen input and citizen participation is something that is, is so uh, unique to Minneapolis and I would think really contributes to our success. Uh, the fact of the matter is that in no other city in the country in dealing with lawsuits similar to Holman have they set up a community-based process the likes of which we have had here to deal with the redevelopment of Holman. In other cities, housing authorities went in, as, as Jeff said, very heavy-handedly, uh, gave people money to leave, they tore down the buildings, and that was that. Um, in Minneapolis, we've taken great pains through the court order and through, um, uh, not the court order, but a moral uh, responsibility and an ethical responsibility to include residents and to include the total community in the planning for the future. Uh, that citizen participation uh, activity is something that I don't think I've seen in, in my travels anywhere else in the country. Well, I think and you, you make makes a good us point, successful because I think we take that for granted here. Yes, we do. That every every mm -hmm. city in the, in the United States mm -hmm. has dozens of active neighborhood groups, and that's just not true. No, it's not true at all. In most cities, uh, the mm -hmm. government does just kind of come in tell you what they're going to do and uh, uh, move on with you or without you. Right, and, with or without. And uh, we don't do it that way in Minneapolis. Although there was a time mm -hmm. when we did that. Is that not part mm -hmm. of it? I remember that there were studies as far back as the 1930s. In fact, I read something that in 1910, there was some study that this part of town was fairly blighted, at least from their mm -hmm. point of view, and then come the 30s. And the NAACP was not only a party to the most recent Holman decree mm -hmm. and that lawsuit, but also in 1947 had done mm -hmm a study that identified a couple pockets of areas, mm -hmm. significant pockets in the mm -hmm. area. Um, can we talk a little bit about leadership? Where is the leadership coming from? From obviously your office and the legislature, but it sounds like grassroots people are coming up as individual homeowners as well. Oh, we have incredible leadership on the north side among the residents. Um, you know, we have more uh, what, block club leaders uh, than any other part of the city of Minneapolis, and they're very, very active people. And um, we also have growing a uh, number of, of uh, uh, renters who are active in the process of citizen participation. I mean, in, in North Minneapolis, we really have a very, very active constituency. And uh, that's what makes, I think that's what makes my job fun yeah. and what makes my job interesting because, you know, I'm, I'm always hearing from different people. People aren't shy about calling. We, we know what they're thinking and we hear from them regularly. Don't always like what we hear, but we hear from them, and uh, you know, I think that's what, what makes this neighborhood very special. Lately, there's been some news that's been very important to this part of town, and I don't want to overlook, for one thing, the um, federal initiative that relates to the empowerment mm -hmm. zone. Mm -hmm. Can you briefly describe what that'll mean for this part of town? Well, Minneapolis applied for the empowerment zone uh, designation. We were one of 12 cities in the country that was granted it. Our application included three parts. Uh, it includes uh, the uh, what we're calling the Greater Great Lake Center or the old Sears building. Sure. Depending on, on which the south side. How old you are, you know, mm -hmm. it's the old Sears building. Uh, on the south side, it includes uh, the semi area of southeast Minneapolis, which is a job producing area. It includes uh, the Holman area or the near north side. And the money on the near north side will be used to fill some of the gaps in the Holman redevelopment project uh, relating to the infrastructure. And that's going to be some significant money and I think financing that's available mm -hmm. through that. Yeah, there's uh, approximately three million dollars a year right now and uh, uh, President Clinton has put in his budget and uh, they're actively lobbying for it to be ten million dollars a year over the course of ten years. So it's a significant designation. But not only is there cash, there's also tax credits available to small businesses um, and it gives you sort of an in with the other agencies of the federal government once you've been designated as an empowerment zone. Sounds like a good program to be part of. We are really, really excited about it. One of 12? One of 12 cities in the country, and I, I believe there were, I heard there were upwards of 100 cities that applied. So very impressive. It's very impressive. We had an incredible public-private partnership that put together the application. Great. And another piece of news, I know, Richard, you're the chair of a development corporation that takes a look at um, properties. Community I guess. Housing Development Corporation. That's correct. right. And there's it's some recent... Recent news that uh, you all just announced? That's in conjunction with the city of Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. Jackie mm -hmm. has the more the figures on it than I do. So, Well, the, the city uh, is going to be helping uh, the Community Housing Development uh, Corporation purchase Park Plaza Apartments, which is three apartment buildings uh, directly across Olson Highway. If, if to, to orient your viewers, if you're driving Olson Highway towards Golden Valley, you'll see three uh, high-rises, which are, they kind of stick up out of the ground. There's nothing else like them around. Those are the buildings we're talking about. And it's particularly important that we're buying these because one of the concerns about the Holman Decree 
is what would happen to the adjoining affordable housing that wasn't included in the site and wasn't included in the decree? Would it uh, become market rate? Would it become upscale? What would happen to it? And I've stated all along that we have a commitment to preserving that as affordable housing. This is our first step in doing that, is uh, the Community Housing Development Corporation purchasing that property so that we can renovate it and make it into really quality housing for families. And the city is involved in a partnership with your nonprofit, mm -hmm. you're yes. saying? Yes. yes. And the, the nonprofit specializes in taking troubled properties mm -hmm. and uh, uh, rehabbing them and putting them back on the market and keeping it at market rate. Uh, well, not a market rate, but uh, at low and moderate income. More affordable. Mm -hmm. Yes, affordable. Yeah, right. We have just a moment left, and Richard Jefferson, I didn't want to miss the opportunity to ask you, with your perspective and your long involvement in the community, in sum, do you think we're going in the right direction? Are things, is, are things working out the right way in some of these housing yes, issues? Yes, but it's, it's a process that we have to work at continuously. Mm -hmm. we, we can never stop working at it because it's, uh, you know, we, we live in an area that is really prime property. We're so close to downtown. And there's so many things that are competing for, for the property here. And uh, to keep affordable housing here is going to be very, very mm -hmm. tough. Well said. Thank you both. Jackie Cherry thank Holmes, you. nice to have you here. Nice to Richard see you. Richard Jefferson, thank you. Please keep up the good work. Thank you. Well, now we're going to take a look at some of the eateries on the north side that nourish the north side. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Well, that was just a little travelogue of some of the uh, better known and favorite uh, restaurants, the eateries on the north side that nourish this part of town. Uh, before I introduce uh, our next two guests here, I want to heft a couple of weighty tomes here. What I'm holding here is actually the Holman versus Cisneros Consent Decree. This is a two-volume uh, compendium here of, I assume, a lot of legal uh, and planning uh, points that are made here. And it's, it was the creation of this uh, and, and the issues that led up to it that we're going to talk about with my next two guests. Thomas Streitz is with Legal Aid Society of Minneapolis. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Jerry Boardman, who's the Director of Housing at the I MCD, a colleague of mine. And I, I thought I might start with you, Tom. Um, what were some of the issues that led up to this, uh, what we now call the Holman Decree? Well, um, it actually was a, an interesting undertaking for our office. And what we uncovered was actually a, a long history of racial segregation in housing in Minneapolis. And what we were able to do is actually go back through old city planning documents. And we actually found literal documents from the city planning department from the 30s, 40s, and 50s that actually divided the city up into racial quadrants. We actually have these documents. By race? By race. OK. Um, and by class, by the way. OK. Um, so we actually produced these documents. And what happened over a period of years is that if you were uh, African American, for example, and you came to Minneapolis and you needed public housing assistance, you were basically shown the projects in North Minneapolis. If you were white and you came to Minneapolis and you were indigent and you needed a, a place to stay in terms of public housing, you were taken to a place over in South Minneapolis. So there was a very conscious and very active uh, racial segregation. So that was a main thrust of the lawsuit, which is a civil rights lawsuit, by the way, and that's not well understood by some people who have uh, talk about the lawsuit now. They, they see it strictly in terms of concentration of poverty. But race really was the under, uh, underlying factor. The second underlying factor that drove us to bring the lawsuit against the city and against HUD, the Department of Ho Housing and Urban Development, was uh, the conditions of the units themselves in North Minneapolis. They were, they were severely compromised. There was uh, a lot of um, structural failure. Sidewalks were buckling. 
Um, the uh, facades were falling apart in places. Uh, and, and there was an annual rite of spring over here uh, in the Summerfield area, and that was the Bucket Brigade. Literally, people in public housing had to go to their basements and bail out their basements, sometimes in knee-deep water. Um, because of the soils and, and other issues in this area, um, the structures really were the second major factor that, that compelled us to bring the lawsuit. And, and, and Legal Aid Society, along with NAACP, were the, what, co-plaintiffs co right. in this? Yes. Uh, w what got the two uh, organizations working together? Was there a phone call and somebody said, you know, there's a, there's a consistent pattern here we've noticed. We really ought to do something about this? Yeah, well, there was a, there's a long relationship between the NAACP and Legal Aid. Obviously, our interests intersect a lot. And the NAACP, we look to as a partner that was a, a, a long-term active defender of uh, the rights of African Americans and other minorities. And so they were a natural ally with us. And the fact is that by the 70s and certainly by the 80s, the public housing projects were largely um, made up of people um, of color. Mm -hmm. um, and so in, when we, through a series of dialogues with the NAACP, uh, we decided to join our resources to combat really this persistent segregation. And um, so, you know, subjugation, if I can use that word, of the residents to some really bad Conditions. Well, now, once the lawsuit was, was brought forward, um, there was a process that it was, what, in the courts for a while, I assume. Well, no, actually what happened is once we brought the lawsuit, the parties almost immediately began negotiating. This was in 1993. And as a result of a series of negotiations with the defendants, the city of Minneapolis, and the Department of Housing and Urban Development, um, we, I think, made a very convincing and overwhelmingly convincing case that there was major problems. We produced the documents I described earlier. And then the, essentially at that point, the defendants sought a way to compromise and to actually come to an agreement. So the consent decree itself really, um, in essence, is what it is, is a shared legal set of understandings between the plaintiffs, the NAACP and legal aid, and the defendants, the city of Minneapolis and the Department of Housing and Urban okay. Development. Well, thanks. That's a good overview. Um, what then was left? What was the structure that was left behind? Obviously, Jerry's here to talk about uh, part of the public sector's role in this. Um, there's an implementation, am I saying it right, committee? That's correct. Okay, that was set up to, what, oversee? Oversee the actual... The resolution of this. Yes. The, well, actually, there was a step in between that. What the, what the consent decree does, in a sense, is lay out a plan for the redevelopment of the north side. And part of that plan was to convene community residents from the north side and um, heads of agencies that have served the north side for many years. So there was a, a, a convening of what were called the focus groups. The focus groups were made up of residents of public housing, um, residents of housing in surrounding neighborhoods, and representatives of various social service agencies that have been here for many years. They came together for over a year and produced a plan. And that plan, their recommendations, formed the basis of what's now called the action plan. The action plan was adopted by the city, and it is the roadmap to the redevelopment of this area. And once that action plan was adopted by the city, the implementation committee was established by the city council to oversee the development of the area and really to carry out the mandates, if you will, of the action plan. And so we so move we're into, it. We into, into implementation, the, essentially, at yeah. this point. You kind of you know, close the history, in a sense, and right. now look at the plan for the future. And okay. that's what the implementation committee really is. Well, about. and then, Jerry, that brings on your role in the MCDA, although there are a number of partners that also sit uh, on this implementation committee. Can you describe who's there and what they're responsible for? Sure, Phil. Uh, the makeup of the implementation committee is, is essentially all of the agencies or all of the partners that need to be involved in, in moving this plan forward. It includes the park board, it includes uh, public works, uh, uh, MCDA as a development agency. Uh, it also includes the mayor as, as the chair of and, and Jackie Cherry Holmes, who is the, the uh, council president. Uh, who sits on that implementation committee. It includes, uh, I think Tom is, is on that uh, for legal aid, N NAACP is on the implementation committee. So all of the partners that are going to be necessary to make that happen, including Hennepin County. And uh, so part of that is, is moving forward in a process so that we can implement the plan that has been laid out. Right. And who, who is the lead agency on this, or is it a shared lead, as it were? Who's responsible ultimately, ultimately for making this happen? Is it the MCDA or public housing, or who's This plan essentially that? has an administrator. An administrator was hired under the city, and that's Chuck Lutz. Okay. So he's the administrator of the process. MCDA is a member of the implementation committee and will assist as, as a staff 
to implement the proposal. But Chuck really is uh, is the person who is in charge He's driving of implementing. That. Right. Okay. And we were talking earlier a little bit, Jerry, too. Some of the specifics are rather interesting and rather daunting that, that have to be taken care of here. Can you just describe a little bit about just a few of the particulars that people are running into in implementing this decree? Well, like any major development project, which this is, it's very complex. There's a lot of little pieces that have to go together. Uh, you have the infrastructure that has to be put in. You have to have a, a developer or a lead developer that is going to implement the actual build up of the, of the area, the housing units, the commercial units that are, are proposed as part of the overall plan. Uh, so all of those pieces have to come together. I think you make a good point. It's not only housing, but there's a commercial slice to this as well. There is a commercial slice to it also. That's right. yes. um, Tom, some key goals here relate to uh, relocation of people. Right. Uh, then there's the actual replacement of the housing. And then there's just redevelopment. As Jerry's talking about, kind of redevelopment of the land, of the area. Um, how are folks sort of measuring the progress in that? Are there benchmarks that need to be taken care of? Are we moving in the right direction from your point of view? Well, um, I'm glad you asked that question. There's a lot to be said, and I guess we have limited time here, but I guess one of the other things that I failed to mention earlier that I think is key in this process that we haven't talked about much that I, that I hope we do is, is another driving factor behind the lawsuit was the absolute is isolation of the neighborhood. Isolation from commercial services, isolation from jobs, physical isolation from the rest of the community. There was a conscious effort made to essentially wall off this section of town by Highway 94 on one side, Highway, Highway 55 and then 394 later on the other side. And what, what we hope to accomplish through the action plan and the implementation committee and this Holman decree is actually to physically reconnect the north side to the south side and, and all the things that that means. I mean, in a sense, if I can use the word, it's a spiritual reconnection to the rest of the city. It's a physical reconnection to the amenities of South Minneapolis. There will be a new parkway which will extend from the north, literally to the south, down in the Loring Park Guthrie Walker area. So that isolation was, a, was also a big factor. But to get back to your question about other, in terms of measuring the progress, the replacement of the housing is absolutely critical. That has not been going absolutely well, to be honest with you. We've encountered some problems. Um, the decree calls for 770 units of public housing. Those, those are the number of units that will be demolished to be replaced, either in the suburbs or in Minneapolis. We're not quite on schedule with that. There are benchmarks. Um, I think things are going to improve greatly in the near future, but we've run into some snags. So that will be one measure. Mm -hmm. Another measure, of course, is the degree of really just public participation and discussion. And on that, on that level, on that note, that fact. There's been quite a bit of that. There's, been a, there's been a lot. As a matter of fact, there's been over 100 public meetings That's pretty about impressive. the decree. So and you've been at all of them, I'll bet. I, I have indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and Jerry, probably about all of them, if not half of them. Anyhow. So, so, no. so that, if you measure community input mm -hmm. and you use that as a benchmark, I'm very proud of what we've accomplished well, today that, and the focus group's work. But and in terms of the physical replacement, the redevelopment, in a sense, that's a story that hasn't been told yet. And I think. Um, we need to be watching that closely and, and be engaged. And maybe we can come back and revisit that a little while down the road. I want to thank you both for coming on. Give us the okay. briefest overview of what's going on with the Holman Decree today. Um, we're going to take a look just now at a clip from a uh, public information piece that the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority put together called Moving History. And it tells a little bit of some of the, the human side of, of what's the outcome from the Holman Decree. So let's take a look at that. And then we'll get a look at um, the did you know uh, spot that we put on as a little factoid. So stay tuned, we'll be right back after this clip. So Sumner Field is starting over again, and a new social experiment is replacing the old one. The new aim is to integrate poor people and not isolate them, and to attract a mix of people to their old neighborhood. We're going to not have our houses slipping into the ground. We'll have parks and, uh, and water and, uh, and tennis courts. We won't be separated anymore from the rest of the community. Those are good things. We may wonder at the relics and examine them for what they have to teach us. But how will we apply their lessons? The design of the structures contemplates amortization of the same in 60 years, and if this cornerstone should be open after a period of 60 years, 60 years. Almost, almost exactly. we are confident that the buildings will have fulfilled the intentions of their oh. Oh. 60 years ago, the architects of Sumner Field knew time would be their test. 
Now Holman has demolished a ghetto and destroyed the notion that poor people are all alike. So how will the Holman era be judged? As we go forward, let's ask the people making the history and the people living it. Did you know, in 1956, Minneapolis demolished 27 houses by burning them to the ground. Why? To provide training for the fire department and to save $350 per structure on demolition costs. Now actually the amount of money that they saved in those days added up to quite a sum, so that wasn't necessarily a bad idea to demolish houses in that way. Well my next guests um, actually have some great visuals that we're going to use to talk about um, some of the visioning and uh, the implementation that goes along with the Holman Decree. Gina Bunt Sr., thank you for being here. A research fellow in landscape architecture at the Design Center for American Urban Landscape, that's at the University of Minnesota. That's right. And a senior housing project coordinator, Cynthia Lee, another colleague of mine at the Minneapolis Community Development Agency. And there's a lot to talk about here, and we'll be able to take a look at this wonderful artifact you've brought here. Um, given sort of the requirements and, and the desire to move forward with the Holman Decree, um, what has been your role, uh, and, and the design center for that matter? Well, the Design Center started working um, on this project in 1993, soon after the lawsuit was originally filed, and we worked to provide technical assistance both to the Public Housing Authority and also the plaintiff attorneys to research the site, how it got to be, what it was, what were some of the issues of the site, what were some of the problems, and how it got that way. And so we developed a series of boards and tools, such as the uh, model that you see before you, to help explore those issues from the beginning and then all the way through the planning process of looking at different development alternatives so people could visualize what they were talking about. Right, and just for those folks who don't know what the design center is and mm -hmm. does, this is obviously a case example of what yes. you all do there. Yes, we work with uh, community groups, with city officials, and look at urban design issues uh, with a particular emphasis, I'd say, on the environmental uh, underlay of the site as well as the physical buildings that you see. So Bassett Creek, for instance, was a strong component of this project as well as the buildings that we were looking at. Well, we're going to get into some specifics in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, Cynthia Lee, you're at the MCDA, uh, which is one of the agencies that's charged with <coughs> taking a, a leadership role in implementing this. Can you just briefly describe the MCDA's role and maybe your own professional role? The MCDA is the redevelopment agency for the city of Minneapolis. Um, we also happen to own quite a bit of land in the project area to be redeveloped. We will be involved in the f financing of the project. We have been involved in the planning of the project. And we will be involved in the actual implementation of the project in various ways in partnership with the City of Minneapolis, the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority, and um, the Minneapolis Park Board, and actually quite a few more public and private partners over the course of the project. So that, that whole implementation effort sounds a little complex, but probably has the right players involved to yes. make the job happen. And speaking of process, Gina, um, we may not go into extreme detail here, but behind you is, is literally a, a pictorial of some of the process that you help lead people through. Could you just briefly describe right. what that is? Um, once the consent decree had been designed between the parties, there called for a planning process with the community. And it was a very complicated process. And one of the things we did was try to draw what that process looks like. And it essentially shows looking at different areas of the project, meeting groups, various community forums, and then looking at alternative proposals, and then finally coming out with a series of recommendations that would form the basis of the action plan, which would get the project done. Right, and, and that's, that's, right that's here what ends up down here at the bottom. That's right. Um, now, Tom Straits, uh, an earlier guest, was mentioning mm -hmm. that there were some 100 community mm -hmm. meetings, and I think he indicated he'd been to just about all of them. How about yourself? You've been at most of those? A uh, good number. Good number. <laughs> and Cynthia, I yes, suppose, as well. Quite a few. Um, and I hadn't thought to ask this. Uh, r rough numbers. I mean, uh, how many folks, and I know we don't have a, 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 mm. a ticker count on this, but are we talking dozens, hundreds of people that have been involved? Hundreds. Hundreds. <laughs> okay, no doubt yes. about that. Yes. Well, Gina, if you will, can you bring us to this? Sure. Um, a fascinating um, moniker that this has been given. I've yes. heard this described as the pizza box. Yep, it got dubbed the pizza box, partly, I think, because of its big, large uh, cardboard container, but also because 
we developed the model so that we could build new pieces, take the pieces in and out to show different um, scenarios. We wanted to show the project area, which is Sumner Field. We're actually in the Sumner Library right here, to show the neighborhood within its larger context. So here you have Olson Highway, I-94, 394, Bryn Mawr Meadows, and all the way over to Penn Avenue, which shows the whole neighborhood context that the project is in. And just to interrupt for a second, mm -hmm. with, I don't know that our camera can get the exact detail, but this almost sea of yellow in here are individual structures, housing. Yes. All the yellow is housing. The red are the commercials, such as the grocery store. We have light blue, which shows all of the schools, churches, all the public institutions, and then the dark blue you see are all the industrial uh, serve, uh, businesses around there. Well, now that's a case in point as to how useful this is because until you just mentioned that, I wouldn't have imagined as much of the industrial, but this brings it visually to mind. And what we're looking at here is a picture of, what's the right verb, what has been on <laughs> right. site? This is what was on site when we first started looking at the project uh, when the, at the consent decree. And what you see are the family housing of the PHA that was on either side of Olson Highway and some of the social services building in there. We also wanted to show people what was underneath the buildings, which in this particular site was really important. You see this curving channel, which was Old Bassett's Creek. It's been in a tunnel for a long time, but still the soil patterns that were created both alongside the creek and way below the creek have really formed a lot of the uh, constraints of the site as we redeveloped it. The soils are very poor to build on. It's expensive to build here, and as we go through the third time of clearing the site, we mm -hmm. hope to learn from the environmental history of the site. So it's both a challenge for replacing things, but that also was a large part of why the housing became so substandard that had been there, am I right? The That's soil right. And the That's crumbling right. Uh, foundations? These deep pockets of clay shrinks well in our lovely winters here and the buildings actually start shifting, the utilities going into the building, you see sidewalks that buckle and so all of this creates an ongoing maintenance problem that all of the buildings in this area experience. Well in a minute I want to talk with Cynthia about some of the um, oh, some of the development issues that are around this but before we leave this wonderful uh, pictorial mm -hmm. Um, tool here, Gina. Can you talk about some of the connections that sure. are being suggested right. to be made here? What I'm doing is putting down some pieces which um, show the schematic design ideas that the focus groups and then action planning process further refine. Important pieces of that are to put the porous soils into open space and importantly connect that open space to our wonderful open space system that's south of the site including the new Cedar Lake Trail, the new trails coming along Bassett Creek and the whole uh, Guthrie Loring area. So this road is part of the action plan, which is to connect two roads which now stop. There are no roads which go across the valley, and we felt it was important to create a new front door to the north side through that road connection. And then the, the new housing will be wrapped around the open space. These are planning ideas we know have worked really well in Minneapolis in the past, and we hope to introduce them to this neighborhood. And this significant open space right. here, which basically says, OK, we've got a problem with soil right. and moisture. Let's celebrate it. Let's right. make use of it. Right. Cynthia, in terms of making some of this real, you mentioned financing, and there are certain tools the MCDA and the other partners will work with. What are some of the issues that people have to pay attention to if this is going to be a success? Um, there are quite a few issues. Um, we, um, collectively, the, the partners in this project, are going to need to look at um, the mix of housing that is developed on this site. What is appropriate for this site, for this neighborhood? How does it integrate with what's existing in the area? How do we create a new market that takes advantage of this significant park amenity that's being created and creates a new community that reestablishes the connections, um, the street grids, and all of those things have to come together. We are talking about um, density, we are talking about levels of affordability, housing types, um, rental versus ownership, and um, integration of public housing with non-public housing. And some of those are still issues that are um, 
being discussed. I yes. mean, that hasn't all been sorted that's out. That's correct. And is that an ongoing uh, public participation yes, effort? Yes, it is. That's yes. going on in negotiations probably. Yes. And also I know that this isn't only about housing, that there's the idea that there, there are opportunities at least for commercial. Mm -hmm. um, are there any um, specifics about that? Is there a certain percentage or mix that people are hoping for or types of things like food stores and it's retail? It's really still being evaluated. We are looking for opportunities for commercial um, services that are needed in this neighborhood, um, that we can bring to this neighborhood that will be successful. Where do we put them? What are those services? How do they get financed? Those are all issues to be determined. We're also looking at opportunities for institutional uses within the project area. Um, this is one location that's been suggested as um, an opportunity area for an institution that could include um, a school. Uh, um, I think it, someone mentioned cultural. the possibility of a cultural organization yes, that could come in. Um, With its connection now to the whole um, wealth of educational and cultural institutions mm -hmm. south of the valley, it's a really nice um, connection to keep making all the way up. There are lots of schools already here. I and see that, that just again, builds that whole mm -hmm. that whole theme of, of education and culture along the two. Uh, from from the two perspectives that you've both been approaching this, let me ask you if there've been any surprises. For instance, as you took a look at this, maybe this goes back four or five years now <laughs> or six. Um, was there one element or feature or challenge that most surprised you, either of you? Um, I'm thinking in terms of this tremendous connection. I have to say as someone who loves uh, cultural organizations and, and green and open space, it wouldn't have occurred to me that a, that a significant connection could have been made. Anything mm -hmm. like that that you folks found was just um, serendipitous and, and was kind of fun? <laughs> well, I like to find out the whole history of why this area got to be what it was, and we found out it was another lake in the chain of lakes 10,000 years ago. So the geol geologists working on the site dubbed it Lake Bassett. So Everywhere you see basically this open space and even up into this area was a large water body. It got flooded and filled in by the raging Mississippi River as it I had no idea about that geologically. <laughs> yes, so that was interesting. Biggest challenges, Cynthia Lee? I mean, obviously there's the ongoing discussion that has to happen, and that's always a, an important and meaningful challenge, but anything tough? I mean, is the financing there? Is, is the public will there? I think the biggest um, challenge um, that we are facing um, currently is how to determine the appropriate mix of housing for this area. A project of this scale is um, something new for Minneapolis. We have not seen anything this large with um, the kind of mix of housing that we're talking about. And with the challenges that the site brings to it, um, plus all of the surrounding um, uses and um, surrounding properties, what, what do we need to do to maximize the potential mm -hmm. of the housing on this site? Give people an opportunity. Before we go, we have probably less than a minute. Um, what will the general effect be on adjoining neighborhoods? I'm, I'm guessing that this doesn't operate in isolation. How do we pay attention to that? One thing we are looking at actively is coordinating some infill housing efforts in the surrounding areas, um, particularly in this area um, where there are quite a few vacant lots and um, also quite a few opportunities for rehab. Um, is that something we can coordinate um, with the larger housing project? Um, to enhance and support the new development. Um, it's, it's a long-term strategy, but it is something we are clearly looking at. Um, and that also will apply to some of the housing down in this area um, as the second phase of the project comes together. Great. Thank you very much. Gina, pleasure to meet you, and I have a little overview here. Thanks. It's good to see it. Cynthia, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we'll be back uh, in a moment, but first we're going to say uh, uh, hello to uh, somebody who's helping to host us here at the Sumner Library, uh, and we'll be back right after she says hello to you.
My name is Amy Ryan. I'm Chief of Community Libraries for the Minneapolis Public Library. I also am involved with the Northside Implementation Committee for the redevelopment of the area. And Sumner Library um, exemplifies the best of a neighborhood in a public library. We've been serving the community since 1915. As the community has changed, first it started out serving a Jewish population. In the 70s, um, we started an African-American collection, which has recently been rededicated as the Gary Suddeth African-American History and Culture Collection. And today, we still are serving, of course, people who have been born in this country, but the new immigrants from Africa and Southeast Asia with a homework helper and a literacy center. So I urge you all to visit Sumner Library. Well, and thank you, Amy, and indeed all the staff here at the Sumner Library. When we decided we were going to be on location at the Sumner Library, um, the guests, the crew, everybody that was involved with this show were really excited because, in my opinion, this is one of my favorites uh, and I think most charming libraries in the system. So it's been nice to be here. Thanks to all of you. No discussion about uh, Near North development, uh, housing, and in particular the Holman Decree could uh, be carried on without talking with our next guest, and that's a gentleman who is the Executive Director of NERC, that's the Northside Resident Redevelopment Council, Matthew Ramanan. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Carol. Uh, and I mean that because NERC, as we heard earlier in the show, uh, has been involved with housing issues and related issues here on the north side for a number of years and really was sort of a pioneer in the whole citizen participation effort. Could you briefly describe NERC's role in the immediate development that's going on right now? And then we'll get into some broader topics. Well, we, we actually have a double role. Uh, at the meeting in, in late 1998, our city council member, Jackie Cherry Holmes, identified us as being the, the local CDC or Community Development Corporation that uh, some of the uh, national companies might want to partner with as a way to make sure that there was local representation in the development itself and in the decision-making process of the development. On the other hand, for almost 30 years now, uh, the Northside Residence Redevelopment Council has been the neighborhood organization representing this particular area of North Minneapolis, with the exception of the Sumner Field and uh, or the Sumner Glenwood neighborhood. But it, when we originally started almost 30 years ago, it did represent that as part of one of our, our, our charges. So we're, we've been very concerned as, a, as a, one of the closest contiguous neighborhoods to the development that it be uh, that the development be integrated into our citizen participation process, and it's somewhat unusual then for a neighborhood to both uh, represent the citizens, the neighbors, as well as have that development role, isn't it? Am I right? It is very unusual, and usually it's not workable. How we've been able to do it is that we've always thought of ourselves as the community owning and developing its own property, owning and controlling its own assets, basically, and so. Uh, this has not excluded any other developers from working with us. We've worked with developers like Greater Minneapolis Metropolitan Housing Corporation, PPL, uh, Habitat for um, Humanity, and others, as well as private developers, uh, pri private for-profit developers, to come in and, and help to revitalize this community. Can you describe the staff? You must have a fairly sophisticated organization then to, to move in both of these directions right. at the same time. We, we have a staff of 13 people. Um, our, our biggest single um, area is housing, both in um, um, single-family home ownership and in um, multi-family uh, property management. But we also have staff that are working with our small business uh, development and economic development. Um, we, we have a community organizer and we have a, a, quite a wealth of volunteers that come through and, and help us on, on, in different areas too. I would assume then with some of these, uh, if not most of these discussions that have been going on in the community about the Holman Decree that NERC has had a formal role in that? That's right. Our formal role is that we've had two of our board members who've been um, on the, on the focus groups, there were two focus groups originally, and there was one for the north side, the Sumner Field side, and, and then you know, one for the south side, because NERC was, uh, as I said, um, bordering on the north side of the development. Uh, we, had, we had formal placement on the focus groups uh, and participating in that, in that process throughout. And you mentioned um, that NERC will be in a position to work with um, the developers that are selected. Now, that's an ongoing process at this point as we sit here. Right. Uh, can you give us a little timeline on when, when, is it more than one or is it just one developer that will be brought in? There will be one lead developer that will finally be selected. It's our understanding that now there are two uh, to be chosen from. There were a couple of community meetings uh, on March the 4th and on March the 6th at which the community had a chance to rank their preference as far as these two lead developers were concerned. Those being the STV, which is a partnership of Siena, Trinity, and Project for Pride and Living, and the second being McCormick Barron, uh, North Star, or McCormick Barron Legacy. Um, and both of those had a chance to make presentations to the community on those two dates, on the, on, on the 4th and on the 6th. 
the decision will be made by the, uh, by the city's implementation committee, we believe sometime in early May is, is what they have scheduled. Okay. And then what happens after that? Once the developer's on board, a document signed, I take it, and then what Then happens? all hell breaks loose. <laughs> so does No, basically, uh, from that point on, we see our role as the Northside Residence Council. And as I mentioned, we've been asked by both of the teams to have some role in the development. We see our role as, as ensuring, one, that the community is kept abreast and kept involved in the process throughout, and that, two, we get the best possible product um, for this neighborhood. We see ourselves as not just coming in and possibly leaving after the development is done, but that we have an ongoing role both in the management and ownership of, of, of the project. And that's been our traditional role here in North Minneapolis. Well, it leads me to, to ask a question, um, not a loaded question, but how are, how are the neighbors and the community members responding to this whole process? Are they excited about it? Are they, are they a little overwhelmed by it? Are they feeling... Uh, Maybe that things aren't going the way that they were hoping. Uh, what's the response? I think there, the, there's, a, there's a whole mix of emotions. Most people are excited about the possibility of having uh, numbers get bandied around, but some 120 to 135 million dollars to be redirected into this community for the total re refurbishing or, or, or rebuilding of this community. And that's very exciting. Many people have been given a lot of misinformation, though, that their homes were in jeopardy, or that there was going to be a total gentrification of the neighborhood. That all of the people who are low income or moderate income people would be pushed out in favor of upper income wealthy people to take their places and that's absolutely not true. But you hear that where we're located now here in the Sumner Library is right across the street from a 64 unit affordable housing development called Cecil Newman um, Plaza. Cecil Newman Plaza is owned by the neighborhood, is owned by our organization. Okay. And a lot of the people there had heard that they were going to get forced out because of the home and development. And we had to assure them that no, we, that means you own this. You as residents and we as the neighborhood organization that represents the residents own this property and unless you and we say we're going to turn it into market rate and force us you out, it won't happen. So the control yeah. is there, the control at least is in there. that particular right. area. Right. That particular. How far back in, in NERC's history does that go back in terms of owning uh, property like that? Has that always been true for NERC? No, it hasn't. When we started out as a neighborhood organization, strictly as a neighborhood organization in 71, we were mainly concerned with responding to the city's uh, allocation of federal dollars for the rebuilding of the community. Uh, then about 1980, we saw that we were having a lot of problem properties and absentee landlords and, and problems just getting a handle on on the communities, it was, it was slipping basically from our, our grasp. Uh, we, st we, we bought our first building in 1980, a six, um, excuse me, a 10 unit building at 610 Logan. And from there, and that was in partnership with PPL actually, uh, Project for Pride and Living. Uh, from there we went, uh, and now we own approximately 370 uh, apartment units in uh, the North Minneapolis community. At the same time, we started getting involved in housing or, for, or home ownership um, for sale um, housing development. And over the past close to 20 years now, we've been involved with about 500 um, homes being sold in this community. Well, that must have informed folks' comfort level about having you all as part of the development partner team. We think so. We think this. that we can help both from the home ownership for sale side as well as from the, the, the property management side that we do have the expertise in both of those areas. I, from something you were telling me earlier, you were originally from the Twin Cities, moved away uh, as, as a young man, came back for school. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was born right here in North Minneapolis. Uh, my family migrated to Los Angeles in uh, 1958 when I was two years old. And uh, I like to think that I was probably the youngest Laker fan to leave and follow the Lakers. <laughs> uh, but I, I grew up in uh, all of my uh, childhood in Los Angeles and uh, came back to University of Minnesota in 1974 on an academic scholarship. Uh, so you were probably too young to have actual uh, memories of what it had been like in the earlier 50s. Very, 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 very few memories, except for what family and friends have shared with me. I, I was told that I was actually in the, in the daycare facility that was ori the original Phyllis Wheatley Settlement House uh, as, a, as a very young child. I've met a number of people, and I have uh, obviously relatives and, and, and people here know my family, so I still feel very connected as a North Sider, even though I didn't grow up here. And the photo albums probably right. inform, you know, what things... Biggest changes that you've seen since you've come back? The biggest change is that, is that I've seen uh, a sense of pride coming back into this community that's very, very strong. That's like the pride that when my grandfather used to play for the Phyllis Wheatley Settlement House, he used to play football against St. Paul, Halle Q. Brown Center. And there was a great sense of pride in the North Side, you know, back in those days. Uh, and I see that pride coming back. I see there's a sense of we can do this together. And we have a community that's always been a community of diversity that has been the gateway for many ethnic communities. And I, I, I welcome it. I see 
uh, Central American people moving into the neighborhood now. We see Somali families moving in. We've had, you know, a large influx of Southeast Asian families, and I not only welcome it, but we think that the diversity is, is, is a great asset for this community. Actually, you raise a very interesting point. For folks that are literally new to the area, they've, they've moved maybe to Minnesota, let alone this part of Minneapolis for the first time, is it difficult to describe and to communicate with them not only what's happening on the ground, but this whole sort of citizen participation process that they now get to be part of? I mean, that must be part of what NERC does, is let them know that they can be part of their own decision making? It is difficult because most people think that there's a they somewhere out there yeah. who's controlling everything, or yes, you can tell us all these wonderful things, but they won't let you. And one of the most fun things we did was we took some of the worst properties in our community that were rental properties, uh, 25 units, um, that we call Level Square, and we asked the people who lived right around there weren't being negatively affected by the drugs and crime. Um, what would you do if you own this? And they said, well, this is what we would do. And they started giving us plans. We said, OK, we're going to adopt your plans. And they said, that how, can, how can you do that? They won't let you do that. And we said, the they is you. They is you. The they is you. And these are your plans. These are your decisions. Not only did the residents uh, help us secure the funds to redevelop this into one of the nicest uh, developments in the inner city uh, in North Minneapolis, but they also um, used their own initiative mm -hmm. to take a little um, pocket park, a small uh, less than a half an acre um, green space in the middle of that development and turn it into a, a nice park for their children. There, there were a number of um, residents who own um, in-home daycares and they needed a recreational area for their children to come out and play in that wasn't, you know, having to dodge bullets and so. Right. Um, this was a real nice piece that they built that development around that park that the residents said is the central focus of what we want to see happen. Michael, we're sitting here in early spring of 1999. Brief timeline, real rough timeline here. Um, obviously, if people drive up here, there's a lot of property that no longer is standing on the ground. What's going to happen in the next two to three years or four years, maybe? What I see happening and what I hope to happen very quickly as a developer is to start seeing units getting built and people moving back in. One of the things that we were very distressed with was that we didn't have a quick turnaround of people moving out and moving back in um, from the home and units. Um, and so we think that that's important for us. At the same time, I, I think we have to push very hard to um, get units built in other parts of the city. Uh, and, and we're working on that. With, uh, we try to make sure that we're assuring our neighbors in other parts of the city that the, the same miracle that you might say we did here in Northside or near North Minneapolis um, can happen for their parts of the city too and also for the metro area. So we're, um, we think it's important that we get more units and get people into those units right away. And that's going to be our first, our first um, job to get done. At the same time, we have to assure people that this is going to be good for everyone. Matthew Rabinon, thank you for at least an overview of what's going on up here from NERC's point of view. Okay. Pleasure to have you here. Always, always a pleasure to work with you. Well, folks, um, in just a moment, we're going to take a, a listen, maybe a look at a few of the wrong answers to our little feature of what the heck is that? Matthew Rabinon knew what it was immediately. Let's see what these folks think it is. Some kind of fort, is it? Looks like a monument to some early explorer to me. Something you don't want to hit with any car that's on display here. Rocky Mountains? <laughs> I have no idea. First rock ever found in Minnesota. Plymouth Rock? I Probably something from Minnehaha Falls. Is, well, is that a governor's pet rock? No, it's not the Plymouth Rock. It's not the first boulder ever discovered in the state of Minnesota. What we're standing in front of is a rock that marks the spot that's 45 degrees latitude. That means it's halfway between the equator and the North Pole. That's what it is. Well, that's it for this edition of Inside Minneapolis. We hope you found it informative. We certainly had a good time up here at the Sumner Library. Now, at the end of the show, our usual catalog of useful information and resources will be running. So make sure you get a paper and pencil and jot down anything that you might find useful. Also, underneath the credits, you'll see a couple of images, before and after images, of uh, the Lindale Homes. That's at the credits at the end of the show. I'm Phil Lindsay. We'll see you next time on Inside Minneapolis.